Welcome to Talking Tuesdays. I am your host, Fancy Quant, and today we're going to talk about the need for analytics and specifically the need for better analytics. So let's just kick off with here just to kind of get dove in here, right? Dive in here a little bit. Um, one of the big advantages we had as a startup was more or less our data and our technology, and we were vastly, vastly far behind many other industries. But we were a little creative with things and we put a little bit of a spin on things, right? We made it happen. Um, But one of the big issues I think, and this is where I feel bad for a lot of industries because they're struggling to grasp this and figure this out. And there are so many con artists out there uh, and even people that have good intentions but aren't necessarily, I don't know, not experienced enough to really be providing advice as we've seen in past episodes of this uh, podcast season here. But for us, for example, in manufacturing and precast concrete, the fact of us using like web tracking back in like 2007, 2008, 2009, narrowing down our customers, like we already knew who our customer bases were, but testing that in marketing campaigns was huge, right? As you saw, um, again, we had positioning on our website. Our website was blowing up compared to the rest of the industry. Then we created bidding wars here where everybody's trying to get, you know, our company name as their keywords. And they're paying, again, marketing firms to do this. So again, they don't have it internally. Um, Just leveraging that data. And we didn't have that much data, right? I was vastly underexperienced. I had no idea what I was doing to start with here. As I've mentioned many times, right? I am not the data guy. I was not a quant then. It was before my financial engineering slash, you know, applied economics background, taking all this math and stats and really applying things, understanding it. Um, I was coming from that background of having like a business background, having an interest in analytics and having some experience programming. So you need that stats piece. It's crucial. It's a big piece here. You need to leverage your data and we did the best we could. But areas that we could have excelled more in was again that marketing space we were dominating. We could have been 10 times better if we would have had a little bit more budget, um, perhaps a little more time. So again, everybody at the firm that we were working in here, we were all doing 50 million jobs, right? Like I'm trying to cover marketing and accounting and corporate finance, working with investors and operations and our president's doing installations and sales and trying to run the business and manage vendors. And then he's crossing over with my areas. I'm like trying to meet with them to do, you know, marketing discussions. And then we have this annual meeting coming up and he's presenting and you know, I'm trying to help with that. And I'm covering IT in the business and, you know, computers are going down, issues are happening. So we were scattered way too thin. Having more people would have been great, but we just didn't have the resources. Uh, But having that data, having that focus, I never really realized it until I got going in this startup of realizing like, hey, we are doing things based on expertise, right? What has worked for everybody else? And the marketing component really spun us around where it was like we were driving to do the really expensive ads in the magazines here. Uh, that's what our competitors were doing. And then competitors were all of a sudden wanting to get online and digital. So they were spending a ton of money on online marketing. And then we took a step back because we didn't have the budget. So I had to get a little more creative with this, which was you know, trying to figure out who exactly our target audience is. How do we contact them, right? Again, they're not super tech savvy at this point. So trying to do this kind of guerrilla marketing campaign of just throwing out you know, postcards and things, but trying to do it somewhat focused as well, trying to get in front of that exact person that's gonna be decision making. Um, we had a fair amount of data, but we did not have it managed nearly as well as we could have had it managed, okay? I didn't have great storage. I was using Excel, which is just laughable because it's hard to manage and store data. Again, if you use SQL, we could have done that. That would have been a lot easier. Um, I mean, R and Python and all that, they were around then, but I had never heard of them as much. Like they were kind of inkling in the backgrounds but I was focused on like C++, for example, HTML, CSS, PHP, things like that, right? On the marketing website. Uh, But if we had better analytics, we could have driven the business far, far further. Uh, The other piece here that I always struggled with was the pricing made no sense. So again, uh, our president was an expert on pricing, makes complete sense. They know about where competitors are gonna bid and we try to bid near those. Uh, but really working with the accounting departments. So again, you don't need to go out there and run and find crazy online data of people you don't know and do web scraping and all this, right? So if you're in manufacturing, I don't know, you're in services, other types of industries, you don't need a lot of that data, right? You have a lot of data, you're probably just not leveraging it well enough. And if we would have had that, we could have done it better, but it was always a challenge for me on the pricing side. I created a pricing, we'll call it a calculation. It's basically like a model, there's some model components into it, um, but we could use past pricing and accounting 
They would update frequently throughout the system and we could figure out exactly what things should have cost on the hard costs, like the you know cost of goods that went into it. But the labor piece was always a challenge to nail down, figure out. Again, using a statistical model, we could have probably figured out which operations director was the best, uh, try to get a better person, use those models to kind of gauge that and judge that and then nail down the hours in there, right? A lot of times you have a hiccup, parts are behind, cash flow issues, cause delays, which also increases labor cost. So again, employees are sitting around, you're paying them, but at the same time, you're trying to kind of balance that. So it's a little challenging, but if we would have had someone with more experience, for example, like myself, uh, later down the road, so future me compared to the current me, we could have done a lot more, okay? In doing this, so we would have had better, more accurate pricing. We could have, I was building supply and demand curves towards the end of it here, but the hardest thing was trying to get everybody on board, convincing management, you know, that we needed to do this, right? Convincing the president, we can automate the pricing. You can still do your market gauge and try to figure out your expertise in it, but benchmarking that against this model of where we see things priced at today, where we see it heading towards the future, right? These things are important. We could have leveraged it and I think been far more successful and probably prevented a lot of the cash losses that we had, perhaps made this business run successfully, you know, for many, many years without filing for bankruptcy. So leveraging that data is crucial. Uh, one of the big pieces that I think is the struggle as everyone asks is Dimitri, right? All these companies ask me, so small banks, for example, say, Dimitri, you're telling me we need better analytics and all that, right? So we should run out and buy servers and buy this and get more data and do all this stuff. And I'm like, no, 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 hold on a second. A good employee is worth far more than what you're gonna get out of buying data a lot of times. So even for small banks, they ask me this a lot. You're better off paying decent money, not great money, decent money to get somebody in the door to really make things happen. But you wanna find the guy, right? It's hard to find that guy or that gal. Uh, you wanna find the person though that has that drive and desire and excitement around analytics, which there's a ton of people with that, right? Millions of people with that that are trying to do this. But you wanna find someone that has expertise and academic rigor. That's where the little bit of the, I don't know, the difference is gonna come in at, right? You can find a lot of people, again, with undergrads, perhaps even masters, but I think masters for many firms is gonna be that sweet spot, right? A PhD is gonna be a little bit too technical. They're probably gonna want a little bit too much money. Uh, the undergrad's not gonna have that rigor to really drive things home. But if you could hire someone, perhaps all stars in an undergrad, or try to get you know some really good master students, bring in a handful of people and really utilize their expertise in statistics, for example, to figure out the modeling to drive your business. And half of the struggle is going to be collecting the data. So you need people that are dynamic, that can collect the data, store it, put it somewhere for you guys in some files, for example, and be able to pull them off of servers if you have that set up, and then be able to really use that data to drive the business. And so, Again, the big piece here, the hardest piece, and I'm gonna tell you guys is hiring good people. Uh, one of the other tactics is if you can find an all-star manager, so someone that's done this before, that's an expert on these things. Like for example, when I go to hire people, right, or I talk to people, I can spot fakes and I can spot genuine geniuses fairly quickly because I've been doing it for so long. And I can interview you and I can talk to you and figure out, you know, this is what you're looking for, this is what you need, and then figure out, you know, these candidates would fit exactly what you're looking for. But often I think now with data science and machine learning on the scene, everybody's dumping a bunch of money in this, they're throwing money at it, and you hire a bunch of unqualified people at a very low rate each, but the total cost is gonna be too expensive. So you're better off hiring somebody 80 to 100,000, 80 to 120, again, for an analyst, for managers, you might be looking at you know upper hundreds, if not in the 200s, maybe 300s. Um, but again, finding somebody that's an expert on this that can bring the team together and really drive your data, again, storing the data, gathering the data, and then building these models and solving business problems is very, very challenging. But we have a significant shortage of these sorts of people, okay? So I'm gonna make this clear here, right? I see a lot of people going out saying, I got a data science degree, I got a machine learning degree, I got a stats degree, I got this degree, that degree, right? But they just don't have the rigor. A lot of these programs are now catering, especially in the master side. Uh, how do we sell somebody a master's that's a year, year and a half, and we're just gonna do it quickly, we're gonna charge them a bunch of money, give them a few skills and send them on their way. Uh, we just don't see the academic rigor a lot of times. And why does this matter? So I'll just kind of wrap this up here with this example. Right? I've seen model developers that are just all stars, that are excellent. Again, no one's gonna tell you this because they work at a firm in the back office, they're just building models, for example, like myself, uh, or validating them or whatnot. But you end up building models and they can build a model 
that will last you. So the robustness piece, they will last you a long enough period. One of the biggest costs in developing models is the actual development period. So if you have to gather all this data and it takes you six months to a year to build a model and you're paying again 80 to $100,000, let's say, for somebody to do this, uh, and then you have to redo it every single year, that model realistically costs you eighty dollars to $100,000, you know, plus health benefits, plus all this other, <laughs> you know, things that actually add up with the cost of an employee. It's very expensive. If you can find people that can build robust models, then what ends up happening is that they might be able to build a model that lasts two years or three years or four years, right? Depending on your usage here. So again, gauging these is challenging, but we need a lot more rigor and a lot better analytics. I'm coming from a background of telling you I didn't do that great of a job here at this startup here, right? I did better than most people in the industry, but at the end of the day, I didn't have that full set of skills to really make it drive and accelerate here. Uh, we need that sort of rigor kind of driven into the business as well, looking for those good hires, making it happen is important. And again, accuracy and defining your problem is something else that's important. So we've talked about robustness, uh, accuracy. Again, if you're gonna do data science and machine learning, you will overfit 99.9% .9 of everything you do. It's just how it's been done here, especially when you have inexperienced people. Now I've seen great data scientists, so don't get me wrong, that will build robust models with great accuracy and great robustness, but there's always some sort of trade off there. And then that third piece is business insight, business intelligence. If the business or the person doing the modeling can't figure out how to properly structure the problem to start with, no matter who you have building those models, if they don't get it or they're not building the correct model for that correct space, uh, it's not gonna do what you want, okay? So defining the problem, looking at any assumptions that must go into this. I see so many people just skipping over assumptions and making them and then like oversimplifying problems because it makes the modeling easier. That's a huge failure on the quant side, the stat side, the analytics side, the business analyst side. Uh, but again, understanding that problem deeply, talking, so again, I've done this a lot, right? I have not worked on the business side for a lot of like my career in finance and banking, uh, but I sit down with these people and I try to really understand what are you doing? How are you doing it? And I start asking questions and I seem stupid often because I'm asking questions, I have no idea like how this is done, but trying to get that really good depth kind of involving them along the way, understanding things from their perspective, as well as listening to your data and getting that balance of, you know, factual data, what's the market doing, what things, you know, how things really exist, and then balancing that against, you know, looking at the business side, the expertise, and, you know, kind of an example here to wrap this whole, whole podcast up here, uh, is really looking at it, and like when I was in a bank, I remember building a model, and you have interest rates that are all highly correlated with this project I was working on, which had to do with mortgages, and when you looked at it, right, they all were highly correlated. Short-term rates were super, super correlated uh, and long-term rates were correlated, but not as great, right? So from a data science perspective, especially if you're using automated approaches, you would have selected these short-term rates, just how it is. Uh, when I did some testing though, and I looked at it, I was like, that just doesn't seem right from a business logic point. It also seemed to make the model quite volatile. So again, if you're using it on your development, your testing and training, it looked fine. But I started trying to find like newer data that we didn't even, have technically in our databasing yet and see how that functioned. Something just didn't seem right with some of the testing and the analytics. And again, my business you know, insight here of thinking it's a mortgage, for example, whether it's corporate or residential, it's gonna be between 10 years and probably 30 years. So I need to figure that out. And we started looking at the business and working with them. And I added in these rates and put in rates that were logical. They're not the highest correlated, they weren't the best fitting, but this model lasted for quite a while just because of that fact, right? Just because I could add that insight. We knew that the, all the rates are obviously correlated, right? They build the yield curve out. So rates are related, makes complete sense. But again, selecting that correct rate based on your business insight, as well as some of that kind of analytical rigor and kind of looking at the problem from both sides is helpful. So we need a lot more qualified people in the industry. We need a lot more rigor. People that are excited to do the analytical rigor part, not people that are excited to build charts and plots and show you all these dashboards, which can be helpful on an implementation perspective. But again, finding those good people is challenging. Um, look for those smart people, try to ask deep questions, try to figure out, you know, ask those questions on why. Like, why did you use this model over that model? Um, you might not be an expert, so it might be challenging to interview them and hire them, but trying to figure out those why questions, you know, do some Google searches afterwards as well, look some things up, that should be helpful. So anyways, we need more analytics, we need better people out there. Thanks for listening, thanks for watching. If you found this helpful, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and as always, until next time.